right? That's what, that's what Buddhahood is defined as. Buddhahood is not defined as some guy still in his own skin only and having, oh, I have a brighter light in my head than you guys, and running around acting enlightened. That was, that's not Buddhahood. Buddhahood is someone who becomes everybody. And having become everybody, they then, and, and somehow he manages to be me, having the flu all February, and it's, he still thinks I'm blissful. He perceives me as made of bliss, even with flu. I don't know how he manages, but he does. But then he notices, I'm not thinking I'm in bliss. I'm thinking like I'm really having malaria. I'm having ague. I'm like I'm having a horrible time. So then his whole job is to heal me, to share his bliss through knowledge, healing. And how do you do it? Well, you need medicine for some people. You need teaching for some people. You need experience for other people. All different people need different things. But if you are, in theory, if you have, in a way, become, or if you become a giant, global, universal CAT scan, and you are all the people, so you are completely aware of everybody else's point of view, because, and you don't have a particular one of your own, actually, really, except that it's all great. You're so blissed out then you should be very skillful about helping each one with whatever unraveling teaching or experience or whatever it is that, they, that would be most helpful for them. And this is the Buddhist view that the, what they call skill in liberative art, you know, the, the upaya kaushalya, you know, the skill in the art of liberating beings is kind of transcendent, that skill of an enlightened being. You know. Okay, so then the body. So then body dissolves under analysis. Okay? Then close placement of mindfulness or focus or foundation. They tend to translate, everyone translates as foundation of mind, but it's not. Upasthana doesn't mean that the mindfulness is founded on the body. It means that mindfulness is going to examine the body. So focus or placement is much better than foundation. You know? Foundation is in the mind, that's all. You know, it doesn't have a foundation, actually, mindfulness. It's a mental function. So then, then the f feeling of pain truly existed then, since they would never end, why would they not affect feelings of great joy and happiness, making it impossible for them ever to arise? So he, Shantideva goes through a reasoning, but his reasoning fits with how you would meditate in looking at your inner pains, your inner pleasures, your inner numbnesses, your inner sensational field, and you would find that you that there's nothing absolute about them. Actually, Wittgenstein does that a lot in his philosophical investigations. He goes through this inner theater of where we feel that, oh, I have this pain, it's so real, and that this is a kind of exaggeration, and we, we have a concept for it of pain, and if our mind, and he really pushes this. Shantideva pushed it in the, in the compassion section, uh, where he says that, even, you know, you, you identify, when, when his mind debates with him, why should I be compassionate and feel the pain of others? My own pain is bothersome enough to me, and I don't have to feel their pain. And he says, well, you learn to experience your own pain by identifying with yourself, and that was not a natural thing. At first, you, did, you were not, oh, that, that's my hand, or that's my mother's breath, I don't know. You know, you were like, you know, and you weren't thinking, you weren't yet conditioned to impose your network of concepts on everything that are given to you by your culture. And so your difference between yourself and other was like not emphasized to you. And so you therefore learn to identify just with sensations coming here. And then, you know, he, you know, he doesn't get into, but you can, um, you can embroider that in thinking about it with phantom limb phenomenon, with people who are hypnotized and they don't feel a match burning on their skin because they've been hypnotized, etc. And uh, there's a mental component in, it's not like pain is, pain is a thing in itself. That's a real thing coming from its substantial, absolute painness, if you follow me. This is very important. But anyway, he goes through all of that, and he says, the yogi, what did he say? The yogis understand. Therefore, as a remedy for such, no experience of pain can be simultaneously pleasurable and painful. If pain is not occurring in someone's mind, because its opposite is occurring, then to consider what has not occurred to be a feeling is surely what could only be called a mistaken conception. Therefore, as a remedy for such mistaken conceptions, one should cultivate the wisdom which analyzes the non-true existence of all things. The state of absorption that arises from the field of what is examined by this mind is the nourishment that sustains the yogi's understanding of the way things exist. That is, 
you know, if you, once you've had your nose disappear under analysis, the thought experiment concentrated where you suddenly realize that your nose is an act of your own creation. Actually, I think it might affect the way your musculature around your nose and face might, might, might affect cheek muscles and things. That guy, Paul Eggman, who, who analyzes all these tiny muscles to tell whether someone is lying or telling the truth. <coughs> I think he might, he said that the Dalai Lama's face amazed him because he spent like ages just observing faces you know, with computers and everything to try to tell when someone's telling the truth or lying. He said, Dalama's face is so open, you can see everything that's happening in his face. He said, there's no, absolutely no, there's no mask. And his emotions totally show in his face, he said that. Paul Aikman. And actually, he, that's not in the book, I should have put that. He had a lifelong uh, temper tantrum problem that was making bad for his heart and everything, his family and everything. And he would only, he only met the Dalai Lama because his daughter dragged him and said, I really want to meet the Dalai Lama, we must take me dad and all this. And so he met the Dalai Lama and he didn't confess to Dalai Lama, he had a bad temper. But somehow Dalai Lama liked him very much. And then the Dalai Lama made him and his daughter sit next to him for some time and then he sat there holding Paul Ekman's hand for like 15 minutes. And then Paul Eggman says that it, he, after that he never lost his temper to the same degree. Somehow he was always able to dissociate from the usual cycle. And then he became a complete devotee of the Dalai Lama himself. He didn't, he didn't like to think that, he was, you know, he was a metaphysical, you know, a materialist psychologist, right? He had tenure luckily, so he, and he was getting older, so he could start, <laughs> he could start fooling around without getting fired. But he would never have gotten tenure if that had happened when he was younger. So then anyway, they do the feelings. Then he comes to the placement of mindfulness on, on uh, the mind itself. He does that, mindfulness on the mind. And this in a way just brings us back to where we were, where he tries to look at con his consciousness itself and he can't find it, of course. Also, he can't find the consciousness. And finally, on mental objects. He analyzes, you know, like right now, if you think of the White House, oh, we don't want to think of that. <laughs> White House, that's public housing. Poor man is having to live in public housing. So we don't want to think about that. Well, you think about the Jefferson Memorial, think about the Washington Monument. You know, you, an image will come in your mind. So that's a mental object. That's an inner, inner close place of mindfulness on things, meaning, and you come to understand that all things do not truly arise. And um, this, somehow, this is, th therefore, you know, the emptiness meditation meditates very strongly that, that um, we, to understand things, and relative things, we, we analyze them in terms of their causes. But if you look at the causation of anything, the, you will not find this one, this was the one cause, etc. And Nagarjuna puts a lot of there's a lot of talk in, the, in these critical philosophers about, this, about the seed and the sprout. And like the moment where the sprout bursts from the seed. And well, then they say, but well, the seed is the cause of the sprout. But then when the sprout bursts the seed, does that mean this, the, the effect destroys its own cause? But when, how long, when is it the cause and when, is it, when does it become the effect? Because once it becomes the sprout, then the seed is no longer there. So actually, in a way, there's no realistic connection between seed and sprout. So they both dissolve under analysis. And therefore, there's this meditation which Nagarjuna begins his 27 critiques with, it's famous uh, in his famous book called Wisdom, where his first statement is, no thing was ever produced any time, any place, from itself, from something else, from both self and other, from neither, or causelessly. And he makes that sort of blanket statement. So that's a, that's, and, the, and then they say if you meditate on the quality of all things, because they are um, all unproduced, then you, that's a way of seeing things as all unborn and unproduced. And that's kind of fun. And I like to say that the Buddhists always say when you're dealing with the world as a conventional thing, in what is called discourse, then you also say the world is beginningless. 
because there's no first cause. Their concept of a first cause is an incoherent thing. Of course, that itself becomes a causeless cause. It becomes an absolute, and therefore it can't relationally create a cause. It just can only be asserted irrationally that there's a first cause. And so beginninglessness solves the problem. Chicken and egg can just like carry on <laughs> endlessly backwards. It's a very liberating idea, trust me. But then in the ultimate sense, also the world is unborn. It, is not, it, is never, it has never come into being. It all dissolves under analysis. If you look, you know, you feel I'm really here. It's, it's, really, it's really a problem, apparently, as a way of seeing that. And of course, but of course, enlightenment, therefore, is defined as seeing it in a way as simultaneously not there and there, you see, which is kind of, it's like a mirror. A mirror is a blank, right? It's just a shiny surface. And then it has content of things reflected in it. And in a way, the things reflected and the surface are really one thing. But can you see them both simultaneously? How do you see non-dually? How do you experience non-dually? So enlightenment is defined as, therefore, in a way that's in a way that's therefore inconceivable. It's like you're both here and not here. And I, when I was in, a, in this point of a conversation once in a mindfulness center, actually, where they'd been just doing a big retreat, I got a little worried because someone asked a question. They said, "Well, a psychopath." is also thinks that they're not there, and then they do all crazy things, you know, and then everyone was thinking of Tony Perkins in the shower, you know, in the original Psycho movie, uh, you know, with the knife, you know. And uh, like he's not there, because he's therefore irresponsible for his actions. So the enlightenment, what's the difference between that and enlightenment? Well, the difference between that and enlightenment is that while someone can sort of be not there, and that's the psycho, and then later there again, and not there, and there again, and not there. And in a way, that's how we all are ourselves, actually, in a way. We're here, but then we're really not here. And we all have tremendous escapism, and we love to fall deep asleep and not be here, you know. And many of us conceive of death as simply not being here. And um, so that's a psycho thing, you know. Buddha's analysis, you know, it, it doesn't make it that rude, but the unenlightened person is always a little psychotic, actually. <laughs> because they are, they, are, they are engaging in the world thinking they are something that they are not, in that sense, and thinking that the world is something that it is not. They are gripped by ignorance, in other words, or misunderstanding, misknowledge. But enlightenment, then, is seeing them being both simultaneously. So you're sort of free, because it's all not there, and yet it all is there, so you're very responsible. You're completely interconnected with everything. You never would be of harm to anyone, etc. It doesn't mean you might not be tough love, you know, fierce compassion can be, but never harmful, right? So now we come to compassion, okay? So, so therefore you can see, if you had that experience, anything that brought you close to this non-dual awareness, that everything is freedom. There's no non-free thing. Everything is, the, the freedom is the freedom that is filled with relationality. And when the, the, the openness of things to interrelate to each other, the absolute openness of things to relate to each other, that there's no absolute that binds these things to relate to each other, that forces them, that is a frame of reference within which they relate to each other, that's an essence in each thing that makes relating to each other problematic. The complete sort of ocean of things relating to each other is simultaneously perceived as what is called the clear light of bliss. It's experienced, you know, when you do attain that point that the, that the, the beginning quest seeker of the true self, failing to find the true self, and it, that failure of being experienced as a kind of sailing past a seeming threshold of nothingness into an openness, into an open space, into what might expect be a nothingness in which it isn't then a nothingness, it's an open space. And um, there's a sense of relief of coming into the open space, which is why some people dangerously think that when they come in this open space, they're, oh, that's the emptiness, that's, that's the absolute. So they think the non-existence of everything, the dissolving under analysis of everything, is the absolute. So then they become actually a subtle kind of nihilism, 
and they are separating the two. They're thinking nirvana is an absolute apart from the whole world. That's a, that's a, that makes them kind of nihilistic about the world of life. If that were so, why did, why did Buddha come and teach the Dharma? Why he attained enlightenment when he was 35 years old under the tree? Why did he work for 45 years teaching other people and founding this whole global movement that is still alive today in the midst of the madness of our leaders and of our elites, of our oligarchs? And the uh, point is, there is no escape. But there doesn't have to be an escape if this is all made of perfect freedom. And then this comes into this strange concept of the clear light of the void, this place of infinite energy of freedom. An energy that can satisfy every need that therefore is the satisfying love energy. And that connects with mystical theism, this kind of thing, very strongly. You know, emptiness, compassion, in the shunyata karuna garbham. So then the emptiness is seen as a membrane. I was like, I love the word garba. Garba means a womb, which is like a membra nurturing membrane, right? It takes some kind of irrelevant little seeds and it sort of nurtures them and it, uh, and it creates them into a humanoid being or another kind of mammal, of any kind, whatever kind of mammal it is. And, this, and the idea that the emptiness, this freedom of everything is this, that everything is enfolded in this infinite nurturing membrane, super subtle, mental energy that is an energy of overflowing bliss, like the bliss one gets when one breaks away from being one solid subjective point banging against one solid objective point. Both dissolve under analysis, and then you pass the wave particle paradox and your infinite free energy, which can do anything, this infinite free energy. But, of course, if this infinite free energy just sort of sort of nuked everything, that wouldn't make people happy. They would just destroy their physical bodies and their minds would go clawing around looking for another physical body similar to the one they previously had because that's how they sort of felt they were warding off danger from the universe. So instead, a membrane enfolds inconceivable, but an inconceivable memory that enfolds everything in, an, in the most nurturing possible way, even things that don't realize they're being nurtured. They are enfolded within this infinite compassion membrane. And that infinite compassion membrane is the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara with the thousand eyes in the hands. Dalai Lama is just one reincarnation of that. All the Taras, the network of the female savioresses, are all uh, involved with that. It is this infinite clear light energy. You know? And of course, that can only be spoken of poetically. It cannot be, the, 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 the ra radical logic Fierce logic, which is very crucial to wisdom, brings one to a negational point, which is, and, and the ultimate negation is freedom. Another translation you could use for emptiness is freedom. But, but um, uh, the repopulating of the relational has to be poetical. It's mantric, because it's born of the responsibility of realizing that how you designate things, how you conceive of things, how you reconceive of things does shape them. Your, percep your perception of them is interactive with the things and with other people. How you see them, how they see you. And so the more responsible you, the more you expand your sense of identification with everyone out of a feeling of pure bliss, uh, the more connected and responsible you enfold them in the membrane of your awareness of their exact conditioning and just how it needs to be nurtured. Do you follow me? That's a shunyata karuna garbam. And when Nagarjuna, and that's, he said that in his jewel garland or precious garland, or jeweled rosary or precious garland, whatever the final title is, Ratnavali it's called, and he expresses that talking, describing the highest teaching. And he talks about how there are four levels of Buddhist teaching, there's good and bad, there's duality of good and bad, of beyond good and bad, then there's finally this non-duality, which he says is biru bijanam, is intimidating to the, to the nervous, biru bijanam. Shunyata karana garbham, it is voidness, the womb of compassion, and it is, and it is uh, uh, bodhisadhanam, which means it is enlightenment in performance. Some people might say enlightenment in practice. 
but I like to say enlightenment in sadhana means a means of attaining something or performing something. You know, I, I'm tired of Buddhists who are always practicing. I like them to make a performance, <laughs> including myself, instead of always practicing. And uh, so that's Shunyata Karnagarbam, which I didn't actually mention by name in the previous, previous one. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? I think we'll go back to the eighth chapter. We didn't discuss the compassion thing enough. We will go back to that. But before that, any question about this emptiness business? Yes. It's hard to understand how for someone who has achieved selflessness, not me. Someone who has discovered it? Someone who has realized selflessness. Yes. Since action is implied by since, compassion? No, no. Since action seems to imply relationality. Yes, of course. Object, yeah. How then does one who has realized selflessness then still act? Right. Well, because, but the point is that if you've only realized the selflessness, meaning you've only failed to find the non relational self that you think thought was there sort of the real self behind all your relational selves. But actually, you never had one, and yet you act. And you act in, in causal networks, in, in relationships. And even your mind looking for the self is an action. And uh, in the Buddhist theory of action, what I call evolutionary action, karma actually is an evolutionary theory. And in that evolutionary theory, your mental actions are even more powerful than your physical ones. And... Um, in other words, if you kill someone in your mind, you know, you hate someone and you visualize them burning or dying or their head building falling down on their head or they're being bombed or in the, by a drone or whatever it is, the mental act of doing that is, creates just as much the karma of killing as if you physically killed them. And uh, in a way, it's more far-reaching because it's at a subtler level within your evolutionary causal stream. Your mind is like that. And of course, as you move to your next life, the subtle part of your mind and awareness goes and abandons the coarser level of the memories of the brain and the physical body and so forth. And so what the mind has gotten used to doing is going to very much influence what it's going to be oriented toward as it proceeds to pick out another possible embodiment. So, so there, that's why in the, in the cultures based on Buddhist scientific discovery, inner scientific discovery, uh, they pay so much attention to mind. That's why yoga was invented in India. That's why the Indians have all these mind sciences, in the Buddhists or non-Buddhist chains, they all do. And because they, re they realize, unlike the Greeks, that you, you, know, you can't, you know, Shantideva has a wonderful verse. He says, if you don't like walking barefoot on the earth, because there are many sharp points and edges and things that will pierce your foot and cause you discomfort. You have two choices. Cover the earth with leather or make yourself a pair of sandals. <laughs> he says, uh, which you think is more practical. So the idea, you know, the reductionism of saying there, the mind has no power, it doesn't really exist, it's just an epiphenomenon of the material, which is sort of, a, and we're going to change the natural world to be more suitable to human beings. We're going to, it's, I always think of a, of a baseball or a softball. The planet becomes like paved over with a suede baseball or softball, you know. Then, then everybody can walk around barefoot instead of making shoes. So the, he used it as an analogy for your mind. Because it's not necessarily what happens to you, it's how your mind reacts to it that determines the quality of your life. As we, as we are seeing nowadays, you can be a billionaire and be very dissatisfied and feel you really don't have enough and you need more and be very haunted and hunted and all pressured and stressed to get more. And you're already a billionaire, which is far more than you can even think of how to spend. And yet you need more. And so, you know, if someone then thinks, well, if I only had a billion, I'd be happy. But that's a mistake, right? So, so mental, mental action is really, really important. And you're, you're acting right now, and you don't have that fixed self that you may think you do have. That's your real identity. And once you realize that, then you become more open to other identities. You, you begin to realize that your identity is, a, is an art form. And you then realize the slogan 
you then give a new meaning to the slogan that actually a cousin of mine invented for the all-volunteer army, a gentleman who was in the, in, the, in the military, be all that you can be. <laughs> you know, in other words, you realize you're a work in progress because you're a relational being. So you can shape yourself. And then, of course, if you get the Buddhist biological thing, that the continuum of the person who thinks they're an individual, but that's how they identify themselves, so they become that. They designate themselves that way, so they maintain themselves as an individual. That uh, when you have the canvas of evolution, where you, you take your own attainments, positive or negative, with you at the super subtle plane, just like I mean, it's really no more strange, that explanation you can find in the Book of the Dead or in the more technical versions underlying the Book of the Dead. Our recently discovered idea that to us now seems the most natural thing in the world, genetic, you know, the double helix, you know, the gene, that, um, you know, a nostril, a shape of a nostril or of an earlobe or eye color or hair color or, you know, parental, you know, epithelial fold or no epithelial fold, that these things can be transmitted from a parental body to another body through this sub-microscopic molecular level of these things with four different pieces of language and whatever. That's like a miracle. That's completely miraculous. It's like a miracle to someone at a coarse level of reality. And uh, so that the, there's a mental gene like that is, is, is not, no more actually extraordinary than the physical gene. Really, but we're just not used to the idea because we're, we're brought up in a culture where the mind has been taken out of the culture. We don't have them. We don't have one. We were assured by all authorities they're going to reduce it all to this and that, and that's part of their code. You know, it's called part of the network of concepts that they control their own emotions and other, other emotions by. Therefore, they're terribly lonely, feel very isolated, and they're all like happily thinking about the fact that all they have to do is die to get out of the problem. No, they are. Then they don't have to worry about what's about. You're sweating yourself for nirvana. I, I got nirvana any time, bang. <laughs> Grit my teeth and bang. And then I'm simply not here. It's like a deep sleep. That's our culture. And sadly, a lot of, there's a lot of Buddhists, unfortunately, or a certain number of Buddhists who when they hear emptiness, they think that's ratifying the nihilism of our materialist culture, which it totally is not, absolutely not. Emptiness, you know, is, uh, can only be experienced by the mind, and a scientist has a mind. And if they're not self-aware of their mind and how it works, they can't really be very effective in discovering anything about reality, but they can make a lot of material Bangs, they can make a bunch of big bangs, they can blow up things, they can, they can burn a lot of fossil fuel, make a lot of plastics. Sure. Yes? Uh, can you talk about the uh, difference between the correct non-dual experience of emptiness and what I've heard you describe as mystical chief oneness? Well, well yeah, well, the, the any oneness that seems to have destroyed the relative. In other words, it's, it, you escape from the relative by entering that nirvana. Buddha left town when he did, left his body. So poor guy, is all gone, you know. There are certain Buddhists, there are certain movements within Buddhism. Buddha let them believe that, although he very carefully told them that nirvana is not one of these states of non-material mental abstraction from the world. He carefully told them that, even in his elementary teaching. But he let them think that because some very self-centered person who's very close around their set of concepts and, and based into their nervous system, actually, and that very closed around their sense of the absoluteness of me, right? Which, a lower, like lower animal, they have to eat some animal in front of them. So that has to be absolutely not them. So anything that's not themselves, you know, except for the maternal thing, is food, you know? It's like, you know, a lot of animal, mammal species, the female has to chase them hell away or they'll eat the kids. <laughs> Sometimes the lion or the, or the different kinds of, no, I don't know, weird mammals, they do that. Hedgehog is pretty bad about the kids. <laughs> and uh, a female hedgehog, is, she makes it like a trench and she kicks the guy out after he's done his, his tiny, made his tiny little contribution. And uh, they're wonderful. So, um, 
So the correct thing is that that the you know we are relative beings. If there's any absolute being, that it's it's a it's a misnomer. It's irrelevant to relative beings. To remain absolute, it can't contact a relative being. If it contacts a relative being, it becomes a relative being. Do you follow me? So any experience you have, like for example, if you attain enlightenment and realize emptiness by disappearing, every sentient being does that every night when they fall asleep. Because every single one who falls deep asleep disappears. Right? We, and we all let go of our clutching on to our sense data and of what we're hearing this and we're safe and we're seeing that and this and that mine and it's my place and there's no smells are really too horrible and I didn't I don't have any bad aftertaste and it's a nice soft pillow and so I can leave my senses in peace but I'm happy to let go of them. I'm no longer being a focus of my senses. Although in dreams then I will reestablish of being a sort of an active subjectivity to senses, to sense experience. I'll reestablish that in a virtual world. But the, I'm much happier to go deep asleep. And we do that every night. So everybody's enlightened. Everyone's a mystic. We're all sleep mystics. <laughs> so the correct thing is that, you know, the Buddha attained enlightenment under the tree. Before he attained that enlightenment of identifying with the entire universe and all sentient beings, all life, and all inanimate objects as well, feeling himself to be vast infinite being as all beings. So imagine Tsongkhapa when he attained uh, what he thought was uh, what, he, what people around him thought he thought was a very high level of enlightenment and when he was 41 years old. Uh, he, uh, 1398, he said well it was really cool and he wrote a lot of grateful poems to the Buddha and so on. But he said it was opposite of what I expected. And, and, uh, but he had been from the age of four, like a child prodigy, a great scholar of all the deepest writings and teachings of Buddhism by that time. And he was already sought after as a teacher. He said it was this sort of clarity, final clarity. He always has achieved final clarity about everything, how it works. And he said it was opposite from what he expected. So I don't, I don't understand that, of course, because I didn't have that experience. But uh, I, I, I think it means is when you want to have, there is a stage in the lower level of, that, of highest clarity when you have your first experience of emptiness or your first selflessness experience. Because there, there are some depths. It's all kind of depths. It's so deep and so powerful. The mind is a human being. And human being is the most amazing being, really. We're all like totally capable of being Buddha, which means we're amazing, you know. And uh, in some life or another, very difficult in one. But um, um, well, there's a stage where one of the last stages is the stage of triumph. Jigden Chunchok, supreme mundane experience, you could say, the experience of supremacy. So if you become a Buddha, you know, we all have ideas, greatest things to be Buddha, we might think that we're going to have this a huge feeling of triumph, right? Some really glorious thing, like glory, you know, right? Like, like, like the narcissist might enjoy in front of a crowd of 30,000 people, telling them a bunch of malarkey and having them positive feedback, shouts and screams, you know, like, ah, you know. So, but if, you're, if this enlightenment means that your identity expands and you are everybody else, equally to being yourself, your continuum of yourself. That's a little bit different experience. A lot of them feel bad. They don't feel well, right? The majority of you have, they have a samsara still out there, right? Ignorance still rules. How could you even stand it? Uh, Shantideva and his compassion thinks, how could you stand feeling the feelings of even 10 other people or three, you know? We have this notion of empathy fatigue and, oh, terrible feeling, feeling well. I don't want to feel too much empathy. Or this is embracing the feelings of all life. And how could he stand that? The only way he could stand that is if he had found this deepest clear light of the void element of pure, what they call Vajra, you know. And Vajra, Vajra 
Vajra in Sanskrit means a thunderbolt, you know, and it's a weapon actually, like a hand grenade or like a drone strike. And the Vedic god Indra is the brandisher of the Vajra, meaning he can shoot thunderbolts down at the enemies of the, of the Aryans, you know, of the Vedic people who came in and, and uh, bit by bit gradually took over the Harappan, you know, the Indus Valley civilization. Three or four thousand, five thousand years ago, and over hundreds of years, it wasn't one big thing. It was bit by bit, and so the, it started out as sort of supreme power in the notion of a violent power, vajra. But then, in the from Buddha's vision, this vajra power, is it, which they can sometimes call diamond, being the hardest unbreakable thing within, within relative phenomena, and uh, but still a relative thing, a diamond is. And, uh, or a lightning bolt, it's still relative, but it can shatter a tree or kill a person. And uh, he turned this into the constitu constitutive nature of reality, is vajra. So there it means bliss. It means an inexhaustible energy that can fulfill any need of any kind. And apparently that's what enables the Buddha to identify in this vast way. For example, under the Bodhi tree, under the Enlightenment tree, all my materialist Buddhist friends are freaked about the fact that they say, well, it's, it was later monks wrote in there to concede to the superstitions of the day. They'll say that. But at every version of Buddha's story that he tells himself even, or is recorded as telling, the first thing under that, that night under the Bodhi tree, he remembered his own infinite previous lives infinitely, like all the previous lives he completely familiar with, beginningless. So somehow it must have been, you know, something where the idea of space as infinite, of time as, must have changed, where he was just everywhere in time and space. And then the second thing he did was he became aware of every other being's infinite previous lives. And then by, the, that, by that awareness, he became aware of all their options in the future, of how they might, he could see them, he could see the open future, but he could see multiple options of every one of these beings. I mean, it's an, it's an ex mental explosion. It's, imagine to have those two things. First of all, yourself. And then why don't we remember our previous lives? That's a question people ask. Although, according to Theravada Buddhists, any kind of Buddhist, it's, if you develop a little meditative experience and expertise, you can easily start remembering previous lives. But if you remember 100 or 30 or 50, that's like nothing compared to infinite. But why don't we remember, all of us remember them? Well, the end of the previous one, we died, and we probably died very regretfully and clawing and struggling and fighting to stay alive because we were frightened what might happen when we lost control. And we did all, we, pay, we suffered a lot of pains, then we were animals and all different kinds. We were in all kind of really horrible states. Who wants to remember all of that? The only way you could remember all of that is if you were simultaneously realizing that it's all made of the Vajra energy of clear light. And, and all, and, but the relative reality of it is not being destroyed, on the other hand. It's all there in the vast, infinite, and timeless panorama. And yet you're everywhere in that infinite timeless, and also everywhere in the future. So then, the <clears throat> third, one, third one was then he, the end of contamination, freedom from contamination, the Dharma reality, the reality body the Buddha achieved. So those were the three stages, the three thorough knowledges, or the three stages that comprised a Buddha's enlightenment as described by him in every Buddhist text. So they don't emphasize, but those first two, for example, if you, if, if you remember even 500 of your previous lives, then any significant other you might have, if you happen to have a better half, or you had maybe several <laughs> in your life, or whatever, I don't know your state or your history, but you might realize, if you remembered 100 previous lives, you might have remembered that you had 50 different relationships with any significant other, some good, some bad, you know, and uh, you'll remember that, so you, because you remember everybody else's previous lives. So we've all been completely entangled and intertwined infinitely, you know, and the Buddhists use that for meditating compassion, actually. And we're going to close with that, I think, tonight. We will. We I should close. I know time is up, up but we started late. So, so the inc any incorrect one is where, in some way, it's all solved by somebody going out to some absolute power who's going to take care of it. 
which is the immature childish thing, the psychotic thing that, you know, daddy will fix it, you know, the president will fix it, the king will fix it, the high priest will fix it, or the absolute God will fix it. Or like if you look at 2001, 2010, Kubrick's movie, that's a perfect, that's such a perfect thing. Big black stone is the absolute. And if you go near it, it ex you become extinct. It seems to be so powerful. Yet it's a stone, and it stands there. Then it produces suns and things. It's like a version of an absolute, in other words. That absolute that relates inconceivably. Okay? So the real absolute is only the relativity. Emptiness means Buddha's discovery. When he talked to all the gods, he kept saying, Brahma, are you absolute? Brahma said, hell no. I'm just wandering around trying to help out. And thank goodness you're here. He, no, Brahma says to Buddha, thank goodness you're here. Thank, and you're becoming a Buddha. I'm so happy. Please teach me about it when you understand how things work. And then please tell human beings that, and even little godlings and all kinds of other animals that when terrible things happen to them, it's not my fault. I didn't create the universe. I was just like the biggest, strongest guy because of my previous life, whatever. So I'm pretty powerful, but I have four faces and Brahma, you know. Actually, he's a very, very faithful disciple of the Buddha, so Brahma, Brahma is. But anyway, they all have versions where you go and then you and Brahma are there all by yourself. And everybody else is unreal, so you don't have to worry about them. Then, you come, then in case you hang out for a while before you die, well, then you'll permanently be with Brahma, because this is all just Brahma's dream. Meanwhile, you, you don't mind being at the top of the caste system, and you don't have to worry about the untouchable down there, because you're leaving with Brahma. Or you become one with God and forget about this, it's just all misery and it's a veil of suffering. Or uh, dualistic nirvana, leave them in the samsara. Tough, gee, I'd like to help, but I can't. You know, you got to see your own nirvana. you got to work it out yourself. I can't help you. Well, Buddha gave you some teaching. That's nice, but, you know, he was the Buddha. He's a lucky guy. I'm just not that lucky. I'm just going to my own nirvana, which is psychotic nirvana. Psychotic nirvana is nobody can bug me because I'm absolutely not here. Permanently. That's a psychotic nirvana. Or a psychotic mysticism. And uh, there are Buddha, Buddha originally taught four states called the four non-material states, although there is a subtle matter, it's very super subtle energy there. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, absolute nothingness, which doesn't mean it's nothing, it's a state where you feel like everything's nothing, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, the most subtle of the four. And he said, none of those are nirvana. But they're in good states. When you get real concentration, it's good to know you can go there. But don't be trapped thinking they're the absolute. The gods of those states of the, of the immaterial realms are those who wrongly were expecting an absolute and then they make of nothingness or they make of, they make of this beyond consciousness, unconscious, or they make of infinite space as if it were an ultimate state and then they become gods of that place and they live there extremely long time, waste a lot of aeons of time, different universes rise and fall, and then they fall out by the momentum of their past karma and then it's like, they're on 42nd Street, like, what? <laughs> what? What? Where am I? What happened? Because the, the, the deceiving thing is, when you go into those places, you have a sense of, you have no sense of time. It's like the annoying thing when you fall deeply asleep. You know, oh, thank God, I'm through with this day. What a day. And then, bring the alarm's going off, you've got to get going again. There's no sense of time when you're really unconscious. My great frustration, the one time I ever had, full uh, anesthesia in the dentist chair, you know, taking out of bed to, you know, I was just beginning to relax. And then they were kicking me out. It's like half an hour later and they need the chair and I got losing my jaw. It's like no sense of being out of there, being a solid escapee. No sense of it. So the, the, the reality, the heart, the, the biru bishanamdo, a little bit frightening to the biru. Biru is like nervous, that timid one. A little frightening to the timid. Because that means there's no escape. Particularly, it's more frightening, I think, to males, particularly, who like to feel very detached and like, I'm free, I'm a free guy, you know. Females, they're sort of more aware of interconnectedness, right? In crisis, they do oxytocin instead of cortisol. <laughs> we, we, we luxuriate in adrenaline-crushing cortisol. 
Right? Okay, now I'll meditate. Okay, now last meditation, and then we're going to quit. I'm sorry, Tashi, I know you're keeping you late. Last meditation together, come on. Okay, now temporarily try on for size your own infinite past lives. Just sort of theorize. Your evolution is such you've been everywhere in the universe, up and down on every possible life form. In the six life states that the Buddha sort of categorized things, but within many subcategories, of course, infinite, endless subcategories. And you've had infinite past that, and so has everybody else. Therefore, every other being, many, many lifetimes within a beginningless infinite universe, has been your mom many, many times. Of course, everybody's been everything else, but why dwell on the less pleasant ones? The mom, when, they, when she was mom, even if it's a he in this present life that you, someone you know or something, they were female in another life, they were your mom. And biologically, that is the form, even if an ordinary egocentric person, but still, as a mom, her biology overcomes that egocentrism, she allows a being to take residence in her body. She gives birth to it. She nurses it. She protects it. She, all, you know, mammal mothers will die for their young in some circumstances. And so it's the most altruistic people get in just normal biology. So now you meditate, and you're sitting in a field. And in the field, in the sky above you in the field are all enlightened beings, and which means for, to you, all those who've ever taught you anything that was helpful to you, even the alphabet or even anything. Someone who you felt truly really cared if you understood this or did that and helped you understand it. All of them are your enlightened beings, whether you think Shakyamuni Buddha is like that or Tsongkhapa or Padmasambhava, whatever. And they are there in the sky like Obi-Wan, urging you on to understand yourself and become enlightened. And they're sending light rays and energizing you, making you feel concentrated and focused and happy. And proud of yourself that you're trying to live up and you feel grateful to them for blessing you. And then around you, everybody that you know, on the left side in the front rows, your loved ones, straight ahead in the front rows, the ones you're acquainted with, on the right, the ones who are enemies, or you think of as alien, or you don't like them, or you're afraid of them, or you had bad run-ins with them, or whatever. And then all beings, all your mothers, and all of them have been your mothers in previous lives many times. So you strive to think of the mother look, the sort of goo goo, gaga, Oh, he's the cutest thing in the universe. She's the cutest. Oh, she's so beautiful. My, I'm so happy. And all the endorphins are flowing. The milk is flowing. The loving mother gaze. The aim of this meditation, which is the basis of beginning one path to compassion, to great compassion in yourself, is you are seeing the mother gaze in every being's face. You, you can remember your mother's face in this life, and you try to remember it as it seemed to you when you were an infant, which you can do, actually, because it's still there in your memory, but we, we've sort of forgotten. But anyway, you try to remember your mother's face when she's most proud of you and looking lovingly at you, not when she's scolding you about something. And you get into that feeling of comfort and familiarity. And then you try to see that face in every other face. And it's better that although all beings are there in the vast host around you, who see you as shining because you're receiving blessings of the enlightened beings, your enlightened beings, and you and they send, you send uh, your, 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 you resonate with them. They resonate with you. And you want to equalize them all as your mother being, what they call my old mother beings. And this is called the first step of a certain process. 
It's called the step of mother recognition. Obviously, when you feel this, you feel very positively inclined toward those beings. Even the enemy, it's, you know, first you start with your loved ones, it's easier to see because they sometimes do like you. And the neutral ones don't have a strong aversion to you yet, so you can see them looking lovingly, admiringly at you. Enemy is really tough, they look aggressive. And yet you realize that enemy looks at somebody like a mother. They care about somebody in their family. They, they're in love with somebody, or even they may be just in love with themselves if they have an NPD, but still they can look friendly and sweet to somebody. They don't have to look horrible and angry all the time. You have to find the mother, it's the hardest, you have to find the mother look, the mother gaze, the motherly expression, even in the, that unpleasant enemy. This is very, very deep and powerful. And actually when it takes, you can do this for weeks, of course, and when I was first learned this, somebody hadn't told me. They didn't give me full instructions about how other living beings, other animals, for example, that you want to be in the host around you, have them appear there in human form. That's the usual way the instruction is given. They hadn't told me that, so I was dealing with spiders, wasps, all kind of weird animals and trying to see the mother look in their faces. And, uh, but, but, when I would occasionally come to, when my teacher would, mentor would send me to New York to see my mother of this life, who was still alive in those days, it's when you walk in a crowd, like in a subway or in a bus or in a street in New York, it's you, everybody's like a deja vu when you have practiced this meditation. Because everybody starts looking really familiar. And it's very nerve wracking actually, because you know, you don't, you know how it is when you see someone and you know you're supposed to know them, but you can't quite remember if you do. And then you, well, this, if you're a little elder, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then you don't want to, in case you, you're making a mistake and you don't want to, you don't know them, you don't want to freak them out by saying, oh, hey, how you doing? Like, and you sort of go through this kind of doubt thing of recognition. So if you, can't, if you cultivate and practice the mother recognition, which I think I give you as homework, then seeing every being looking at you like their loving mother, then you, can, you might have some deja vu experience if you work on this. Okay. Anytime you meditate, you should always think that whoever you think are enlightened, doesn't have to be Buddhists or Buddhas, but whoever you think is enlightened beings, that they are there present in their, on a sort of subtle body level, and they're blessing you, and they're giving you confidence, and they're helping you put aside your usual self-deprecating ideas about, I don't know how to concentrate on this, or I don't think I really understand that, or I, I don't know how to meditate, or I this, or I that. All kind of self-confining concepts that you encase yourself in by creating a, a, an environment, visualized environment like that, a sort of shrine space with your mentors in the above you there alive and shining in light in Obi-Wan Kenobi style. Then that's very good. And then, then that all the other beings are there around you, you should always also bring them there. So you have the sense of what you're working on, whatever it may be, mindfulness or mother recognition or selflessness, whatever it is, that uh, you are doing it for them. And any change in you, you want to resonate, just morphically resonate to them so they will have this kind of change in their mind to whatever degree they're capable, according to their own conceptual matrix. Okay, ding, good night everybody. Thank you very much.